Thanks, Hugh Vermavens. It's a great pleasure to join you today to examine the contributions of the first Americans to our nation's rambunctious comic traditions. I follow in the wake of Judith Yarrow Lee's pathbreaking essay, American Humor and Matters of Empire. Her analysis sweeps across frontiers of history, literature, and most genres to redefine the parameters of the comic world first shaped by Constance Rourke so many years ago. Today, I'll apply Lee's theories to what I call internal imperialism, which best describes the centuries long assault on indigenous peoples, a trajectory that sadly continues to this day. Fortunately, the rich resources of native humor have combated these assaults repeatedly and never so much as during the past 30 years. I'll briefly look at some cartoons, um, uh, refer to drama, film, and stand-up comedy, and then as much as I can, I'll look at uh, what I've written about Alexandra Posey, Thomas King, James Welch, and Hannah Gigama, and maybe at the end we'll have a, a taste of Sherman Alexie and Leanne Howe. For much of our history, that stern, unyielding profile of the Indian that used to grace our nickels has dominated the popular imagination. The feathered, tearful Indian on horseback on an interstate who starred in a modern ad against littering is a contemporary example. Indians, it was believed, never laughed despite early testimony to the contrary by Washington Irving. His 1832 trip across the prairies that he and the Indians uh, produced this comment, no Stoics, when Indians are among themselves, there cannot be greater gossips. There are great mimics and buffoons. They entertain themselves excessively at the expense of whites in satire, mimicry, and mirth. A modern native critic, Vine Deloria, brings this up to date, declaring that humor permeates virtually every area of Indian life, so much so that nothing in Indian national affairs is possible without it and that people are frequently educated and made militant by biting activist humor. I don't need to point out the myriad ways indigenous citizens have been stereotyped, but I would like to show how natives have turned the table on cartoon images. Here is a set of cartoons from the magazine Judge from the 1890s, whose pages variously depicted Indians as predatory, violent, evil, and prone to atrocity and murder, but also degraded as to, so, so degraded as to be comic. And here we have the caption, me heap, uh, me heap big bad ninja, wow, wanty grub sudden, wow, wow. You can see how the, uh, the facial features resemble an ape too, which is quite common in stereotypes at that time. The next one, um, Little Johnny, the Dago didn't think he was the man around the house, did he, Marm? You see a conflation here, of course, the, of the uh, pejorative slurs against Italians and, and uh, Native Americans. Okay, and the, the uh, last one. Uh, oh, my dearest Joris, I feared me you had forgot your promise to dine with your Apache. Set you down, my love. And of course, Joris is out with arrows in the back. Okay, well, the tables have been turned in um, modern day cartooning and the wonderful uh, Navajo cartoonist Vince uh, Craig um, has a, a, a number of figures for us to consider. Look, cheap, he big iron bird, that's an airplane, you turkey. Next one. Someone should teach him to speak Indian. In essence, communication is an irrevocable essentiality. <laughs> okay. This is my favorite. Yeah, my great grandmother was a Cherokee princess. Always a Cherokee princess, isn't it? And then he's thinking, I wonder what's for supper. Then the next one, I think. Repent, heathen. And of course, this brings up the uh, history of Indians and missionaries. So I think the tables have been turned, at least in terms of cartoons. And then, of course, stand-up comedy is something a lot of you are experts on. One of the writers I hope I'll get to is Sherman Alexie, and although he is prolific uh, novelist and short story writer, he's also done screenplays, he has also done stand-up. Um, 
And one of his peers, Drew Hayden Taylor, um, like him, performs stand up and has also made films such as Redskins, Tricksters, and Puppy Stew. And they have a pal, Don Kelly, who has contributed jokes from his routines in an essay to Taylor's edited collection, Me Funny. And uh, here are a few of them. I hope I'm not offending anybody, folks. If I have, well, as we Indians say, my face is red. Or native people are the Rodney Dangerfield of Canadian society. We get no respect. I mean, we're the only people where it's okay to name vehicles after us. Vehicles. Hey, Don, check out that Pontiac, that one of Winnebago. What do you think of that Jeep Cherokee? Well, I kind of like that Ford Negro myself and that Dodge quadriplegic. Native humor, while possessing its own distinctive forms and traditions, has of course been shaped and influenced by developments in national comedy. And we can see the native origins of this tradition in ethnic newspaper columns, particularly those that involve conversations between a backwoods philosopher and a friend, client, or visitor. And often these were written in dialect. While humor always punctuated the oral traditions of indigenous people, the most striking early printed form came in the comic columns of the editor of the Eufaula Indian Journal, Alexander Posey, whose short life spanned 1873 to 1908. A model for his columns were the Chicago uh, productions of the celebrated Irish American Finley Peter Dunn, whose fictional creation, the Irish bartender, Mr. Dooley, held forth in his Archie Road saloon, usually to his somewhat dim customer, Mr. Hennessy. Another source was certainly Posey's contemporary and fellow writer for the journal, Charles Gibson, whose rifle shot columns share many characteristics of Posey's Hughes Fixico letters. Posey and Dunn were editors of other areas of their newspapers as well, and thoroughly understood their audiences and the popularity of already existing types of American parody. As Eva Gruber notes, native literature has frequently taken up familiar, symbolically charged, stereotypical images and representations of native people and native white history in order to subversively re-encode or reimagine them. By evoking laughter, they create a liminal space where familiar interpretive patterns are rendered invalid and readers are free to reevaluate. Dunn's Dooley columns were originally intended to counter anti-Irish sentiment that Dunn had experienced, but eventually they commented on national affairs as well. Like Dunn, who was writing at the same time, Posey hoped to shepherd his people through a difficult period of transition to preside over the end of the Creek Nation and the transformation of the people into Oklahomans. The complicated details of the Dawes Commission's activities, which ultimately led to the loss of much native land and the machinations of government agencies and missionaries constituted a new kind of colonialism as the people already displaced once were manipulated yet again. Posey, as Dunn did with Dooley, uses Hughes Fixico, the words mean heartless bird himself, as a kind of reporter on conversation he listens to and participates in in the Creek community. Fuse is at first the dominant voice, but soon other characters take over, especially the volatile and salty hot gun and his pals Tuk Pataka Mika, wolf warrior and Kono Harjo. The men often begin their criticism of settler social nonsense by spitting. Posey's columns display a pride in Creek English dialect, along with an awareness that dialect is rich, humorous, laden with metaphor, and therefore tactile and appealing. Since dialect, at least to the oppressor, is part and parcel of the negative stereotype, pride in dialect constitutes inversion. Dialect therefore becomes transformed from an oppressive signifier of otherness into a pride-inspiring prism one which may be reversed for the critical inspection of the other white Protestant America. At the same time, dialect writing is a kind of protective cloak. The rustic satirist is less inclined to draw ire from the urbane reader. Dunn could have been speaking for Posey as well when he hemmed the advantages of this. While I was writing editorials for the Post, he said, we became engaged in a bitter fight with the crooks in the city council. It occurred to me that while it might be dangerous to call an alderman a thief in English, 
No one could sue if a comet Irishman denounced the statesman as a thief and brogue. The use of dialect as a mask reminds us of Silenus, a rather homely hair covered old man who had a beautiful soul. Ancient Greek culture used him as a trope for mystical inversion, crude and simple without, but complex and finely wrought within. There is a hedonistic strain to Silenus too, for he was the teacher of Bacchus. As Judith Lee reminds us, the Yankee peddler figure, brother Jonathan, uncle Sam, the frontier humorists and the Cracker Barrel philosophers who populate the pages of traditional American literary humor all share this pose. Fuse Fixico, however, belongs to an oppressed ethnic group that perforce must have a double pose in consciousness as members of the American nation, yet who are not of it. As someone raised partly as an Indian, but educated in the Eurocentric tradition, Posey had what Du Bois has called in connection with African-American culture, a double consciousness. One benefit, it is peculiarly suited to handle the double nature of humor, which so frequently results from incongruously doubled meanings. Nor does Posey spare his own people. His self-reflexive comic sermons describe how Creeks let white merchants turn them into materialist consumers. Hot gun decries imposed consumerism. So everywhere you go now, you find lightning rod for clothes, clotheslines, steel range, cook stoves for the children's playhouse and calendar clocks for ornament over fireplace and old buggies for curiosity. And still hot gun says, engines was ready to bite like a bass when you use grasshopper for bait. Posey, religiously skeptic, admired Robert Ingersoll, the noted lecturer and ag agnostic who had the chutzpah to satirize the Bible, as in his famous essay, Some Mistakes of Moses. Like Ingersoll, Posey parried a scripture to ironic effect. Statehood was a sad thing for the engine, but I didn't have no tears to shed. The new politician was my shepherd and all I got all I want. He was cultivated my acquaintance for his party's sake. He was prepared the table before me in the presence of the bartender and hold up two fingers and call for a couple of small ones. He was tell me eat, drink and be game for baby. So tomorrow I want you to vote for me. This fits nicely with the white man's hypocrisy which earlier gets expressed through religion. The white man was graft hard all week and maybe so think a heap of Jesus on Sunday. Posey created a rich cast of Indians and corrupt politicians that rivals Mark Twain's uproarious crew in the Gilded Age. The book constituted duty by the letters also resembles Johnson Jones Hooper's Simon Suggs stories where it is good to be shifty in a new country. Instead of punningly named characters like Twain's Orpheus Seeker, we have real figures like Senator Owen, who here becomes Colonel Roberts L. The corrupt Secretary of the Interior, Hitchcock, who contributed to land frauds, becomes Secretary Itzcock. The arrogant President Teddy becomes Rooster Feather. Over some white mule uh, liquor, Posey's characters easily segue into a diatribe against the federal government. Well, maybe so. The bow weevil was ruining the cotton and the chintz bug was getting his work on the corn. Big man at Washington put a few more kinks in the red tape of the Royal Creek payment. But all the same, the Japs was still doing a rushing, meaning Russian, business and they was lots of good prospects in the flowery kingdom. Washington, the frequent destination of Indian negotiators, becomes the repeated object of Fuse's ridicule. He uses it on Indian politicians, too. Creek politics was getting warm like hot tamale, and candidates for chief were thick like fleas under a pole cabin in the summertime, or maybe so bed bugs in a dollar day hotel when you blow the light out. Figures like Posey's and others eventually led to postmodern novels such as Thomas King's brilliant and hilarious uh, Green Grass Running Water, 1993, which employs traditional Native American humor, including tricksterism, scramble chronology, animal and scatological humor, with contemporary comic conventions, including stand-up comedy, satire, pastiche, and code switching. The narrative operates on two levels, which I term magical meta and the realistic. 
Two basic stories overlap in the realistic level, which centers on contemporary Blackfeet characters, many of whom have been educated and achieved prominence. Among them, the determined Eli stands alone, a retired University of Toronto literature professor, installs himself in the family home on native lands that is threatened by a needless monumental dam. Meantime, a cross-ethnic romantic triangle is acted out by his nephew, Lionel Red Dog, an electronic salesman. His rival is his cousin, Charlie Standing Bear, a sellout lawyer who represents the dam's financiers. And then there's the woman they both desire, Alberta Frank, also a college liter literature professor. These characters and related figures try to negotiate the demands of postmodern non-native existence with their longings to maintain ties with their culture, personal stories set against the incursions of the state, which constitute a repetition of imperial history. On the meta uh, magical level, King presents four old Indians who have apparently escaped from a nearby mental institution. They may or not may not be avatars of native religious icons, but they're also constantly identified with key characters of American popular literature and classic American and British literature. The first to appear are Ishmael, Hawkeye, Robinson Crusoe, and prominently the Lone Ranger. All of these literary figures, of course, have native sidekicks in their classic narratives, Queequeg, Chingachgook, Friday, and Tonto, respectively. The old Indians take turns telling a basic creation story, which always involves a woman who has four avatars. First woman, changing woman, thought woman, old woman, they, who falls out of the sky into the waters that envelop the earth. All of these tellings, however, are constantly foiled by the machinations of Coyote, who is always interfering as he of course does in Native American mythology as well. Paradoxically, Coyote's disruptions lead to the endless retelling of the mythic stories, which are comically juxtaposed with uh, the aforementioned classics of Western literature. While King gets a lot of comic mileage out of this device, it also suggests the dynamic nature of native culture and its ingeniously subversive strategies. The newfangled tales question the values of the white narratives, often making them ridiculous, but also creating new meaning as the stories collide. The narrator tells Coyote, who no doubt knows this anyway, there are no true coyote, only stories. They also seem to be avatars of native tricksters themselves as they all speak native languages as well as English. While the four play mythic roles as I've, I have indicated, they're also real, they are also real figures in the novel uh, as the asylum patients. The head doctor there, Dr. Joseph Hoval is constantly searching for them aided by his assistant, Babo Jones, a black woman who is apparently descended from the fictional Babo of Melville's Benito Sereno, because we find out she comes from a family of barbers. The early escapes of the old Indians have coincided with disasters, such as the 1929 stock market crash, the St. Helens eruption, and wildfires in Yellowstone. The old Indians themselves, however, declare they're on a mission to fix things. Disasters, of course, often clear the ground, enabling a new beginning, which in the native realm also means coming home, starting the story over again. This aligns well with Bakhtin's notion of folk humor as uncrowning or more extremely annihilating as it sweeps away all sense of pretension, formality, and hierarchy with a hurricane of laughter clearing the ground for new formulations. The categories sometimes distinct also merge and blur at times which is part of the comic dynamism. Uh, at the end of the story, uh, <clears throat> the dam uh, is exploded by the machinations of Coyote. And uh, unfortunately, the ancestral home with Eli in it is destroyed, but it does open up uh, the possibilities of new heroism at the Sundance uh, where Lionel uh, uh, establishes her her heroism. One of the funniest parts of the book is Lionel's sister Letitia's restaurant, the Dead Dog Cafe, where she, the meat she serves gullible tourists are supposed to be canine. Always using groups of four, Kings creates a group of tourists whose names are Nelson, Jeanette, Rosemarie, and Bruce. 
Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald plays, uh, play the native uh, Rosemary and the Royal Canadian Mounted Bruce in the most mythical Hollywood treatment of Canada, the musical Rosemary. The sugary plot features a treacherous half-breed guide who betrays the title heroine not once but twice. The famous duet is the Indian love call. As the singing duo's most popular and acclaimed film, it became an iconic work for Canadians, uh, even though it was full of stereotypes, much like the U.S. South image in Gone with the Wind. This reference is part of King's apparent desire to honor Canadian culture, even as sillier images, which are ripe for parody. The Dead Dog Cafe concept eventually led to King's Canadian Broadcasting Company radio programs entitled The Dead Dog Comedy Hour. The other device linking the characters is the Sundance, which uh, concludes the work. Green Grass Running Water, a thoroughly postmodern novel, is also deeply expressive of Native culture, its history, its present, and its possible future. The novel rides on the crest of interbraided stories of sorrow and colonial persecution. Ultimately, however, as uh, Visner suggests, trickster discourse in general uh, has a therapeutic narrative, a characteristic of many ethnic literatures that has been missed by key apostles of postmodernism like Leopard and Jameson. During the concluding Sundance, Coyote joins in in uh, causing this earthquake. Uh, as uh, um, I mentioned, there are uh, several villains and they all have cars and somehow the cars have gotten uh, thrown in the lake. And we find out for the first time they're red, white, and blue, but they're also identified as Nissan, Pinto, and Carmen Gia, which is a rather dreadful pun on Columbus's Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria. This can be read as a comic signification on Columbus, the butt of many native jokes, uh, <clears throat> citing the original ships, of course, in the classic, the native says to his companion, there goes the neighborhood. That joke has a deadly serious meaning in terms of stolen lands and broken treaties, which is signified here in the proposed late parliament subdivisions that would have been built if Eli had not fought the developers with his lawsuits. Humor punctuates native drama as well. Hene Gigama burst on the literary and theatrical scene in 1972 when his play Body Indian was staged in New York. Other uh, early native playwrights uh, pre preceded him, but uh, none of them were so focused on the, the clash between native culture and, uh, and Imperial America. Gagama's three path-breaking plays, Body Indian, Foghorn, and 49, ruptured notions of brave noble savages and dragged the American theater kicking, but ultimately laughing into the 20th century native universe, a realm always intersecting with the larger social and political events of the day. Body Indians was praised by Times critic Clive Barnes and many noted that this was the first native play presented on the New York stage. It has gone on to become the best known, most produced, most anth anthologized native play. In five scenes uh, in one act, uh, it depicts the robbery of Bobby Lee by his close Indian friends. Since he is an alcoholic with a wooden leg, which gets stolen in the last scene, Gigama was playing with stereotypes and more dramatically changed the joke to shift the joke, as Ralph Ellison would say. That is the comedy humor, comedy and humor he summons up with the material simultaneously offers an indictment of the conditions that caused the absurd um, situation. The wooden leg also, of course, recall, recalls Flannery O'Connor's story, Good Country People, and Nathaniel West's scathing novel, A Cool Million, the dismantling of Lemuel Pipkin about the gradual dismemberment of the central figure's body. The original full title of the play was an extended riff on its own. Body ending or the searching, rifling, rolling, and subsequent dismantling and hocking of an orthopedic device employed on the severed leg of one Indian Bobby done by certain of his fellow tribesmen during a merry party in a room above Marie. Nowhere are these methods more salient than in Foghorn, which concerns the 19-month Indian occupation of Alcatraz prison in 1969, a milestone in native resistance to internal imperialism and the movement for restitution of lands. Gigamai's electrifying sleight of hand uses this ostensibly revolutionary and serious event 
to satirize all previous stereotypes. As such, the play's 11 scene Brechtian structure morphs into something quite new, a Native American comic panorama that mirrors the absurdities of US Native American relations over the centuries. As Gigamai integrates indigenous humor with broader Western comic traditions to critique a contemporary oppression. It was first presented at Teatro im Reichskabarett of uh, West Berlin in a 1973, and the authors note uh, the uh, Gagigamai admits that almost all the characters in this play are stereotypes pushed to the point of absurdity. The satire proceeds by playful mockery rather than bitter de denunciation. A production should aim at a light, almost frivolous effect. The actors should never appear to be preaching, nor should they strive too much for laughs. They should simply let them occur. This note borrows much from native storytelling traditions, but also from the absurdist theater of Artaud. He also hopes that the actors will know how to sing as he includes stereotypical songs such as Pass That Peace Pipe and Bury That Hatchet from the 1947 Hollywood musical Good News. He also includes the Indian Love Call, the William Tell Overture, and the cast list includes a nun, an altar boy, a 1900 school teacher in Stars and Stripes skirts, Pocahontas, Lone Ranger, and Tonto, the First Lady, and a bull. Gigama also indicates the actors should drag bundles of belongings on travois, in, 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 indicating the trail of tears um, uh, that continued uh, tragic sequence all, on up to the occupation of Alcatraz. Electronic music sets the contemporary mood as a huge painted Indian face is projected over the stage. Voices of male and female settlers decry vermin, varmints, as manifest destiny and Indian removal gets played out in only a few lines. The foreground leads to the denim dressed mod Indians who are seen occupying Alcatraz. The narrator ironically intones, we, the Native Americans, reclaim this land known as America in the name of all American Indians. We wish to be fair with the Caucasian inhabitants. We pledge we shall give to them a portion of the land for their own. We will further guide the majority inhabitants in the proper way of living. We will offer them our religion, our education, our way of life in order to help them achieve our level of civilization and thus raise them and all their white brothers from their savage and unhappy state. In another episode, Pocahontas tells her maidens about her seduction by Captain John Smith, but in the event, he loses his erection, and her speech at this point includes a kazoo whistle on a downward scale. The maidens squeal with laughter. The Lone Ranger complains to Tonto, who's polishing his boots. It looks maybe like I'm not too smart having to rely on an illiterate engine like you to do the clever thinking and outsmarting the white man. He suggests a series of actions whereby Tonto gets shot and is saved by the Lone Ranger's surgery. But Tonto's effort to tell him which a order to bypass kills him. Tonto, how's that? They'd just be the Lone Ranger. Tonto's whose only line in the scene is Kimo Sabe cuts the Lone Ranger's throat. Okay, uh, I have some material here on the uh, the key uh, manifestation of teasing in Native American culture. And it goes through a reading of James Welch's wonderful novel, Fool's Crow, uh, which was published in 1986. However, I have an essay on this novel coming out in our journal shortly. So I'm only uh, gonna refer to it here because I wanna save time for uh, questions. So I'm gonna skip over that and go to the conclusion. I want to briefly consider the comic contributions of Sherman Alexi and Leanne Howe. And she, by the way, she's my wonderful colleague here at the University of Georgia. We were really lucky to get her. Uh, you can see on the cover um, of her book, which uh, we just had the slide for, that she thinks of herself as a comic writer in many ways. This is her book of essays, Chalk Talking on Other Realities. She's also come up with a fascinating theory of uh, Native American culture called tribal, tribalology, which is very uh, influential. And uh, this is one of the mo most frequently used publicity shots of Sherman Alexie, and obviously uh, his laughing demeanor uh, is suggestive of, of a lot of his work. 
His characters, especially his young adults, employ humor as a way of dealing with the absurd conditions of modern life. In his young adult novel, Flight, the character Ziz has lived in 20 foster homes. Alexi has stated, being funny breaks down barriers between people. If I make them laugh first, I can say almost anything to them. On another occasion, he observed, laughter is as ceremonious the way people cope. He's also stated, if I were saying the things I'm saying without a sense of humor, people would turn off right away. I mean, I'm saying things people don't like for me to say. I aim to be funny. I aim for my humor to be very political. But I think more along the lines of political stand-up comedians like Richard Pryor and Lenny Bruce than I do about other writers. Both Alexi and Howe take aim at characters who become politically corrupted as they ascend Western hierarchies of power, something that Welch also does with the character of Al Child and his band in Fool's Grove. In his novel, uh, uh, well, a collection of short stories is like a novel, The Lone Ranger and Tonto, a fist fight in, in heaven, and also in a later novel, Reservation Blues, a character David walks along, as his name implies, plays the game of the hated Bureau of an Indian Affairs official. Alexi justifies his satire by declaring, if there's only one thing we've assimilated fully as Native Americans, it's political corruption. For the most part, the tribal council people I've known have been self-serving, manipulative capitalists. They acquire little power on the res and it corrupts them. Indeed, this becomes the main theme in Leon Howe's uh, uh, very important novel, Shell Shaker, um, which came out in 2001, um, where she links the betrayals of the historical Choctaw chieftain Red Shoes in the 18th century <laughs> with a postmodern Indian leader, Red McAllister, who is murdered by his lover after he betrays both her and the people. Both writers, while dealing with quite serious and often traumatic narratives featuring collisions between native culture and the state, employ humor to enliven the narratives and perhaps to offer a degree of hope. Although Alexi has said that native cultures appear in the long run to be doomed, Howe's second novel, an account of an early native ba baseball team, Nico Kings, ingeniously braids history, invention, and humor into an inspiring and entertaining narrative that insists on the centrality of native cultures to our national identity. She's also published a number of satirical essays, particularly in Chalk Talking on Other Realities, that take on the bond industry, New York City pieties, and other sacred cows from a native perspective. She isn't shy about using the staple of self-reflexive humor either, as in her hilarious essay, I Fuck Up in Japan. Alexi came to promise uh, originally with the Lone Ranger and Tonto, a set, set of interlocking tales that trace the comic relationships between Kira Deline natives, uh, Thomas and Vincent. The stories were such a success that he wrote a screenplay based on one of the tales for a movie, Smoke Signals. The film, like most of Alexi's work, demonstrates all three of the major characteristics of native humor that I've stressed, stereotypes, the need to debunk them, teasing, and self-reflective humor. Victor's father, Arnold, drunk on the 4th of July in 1976, sets off a house fire that kills Thomas's parents, who throw the infant Thomas out the window. He and Vincent grow up together and are equally devastated when Arnold vanishes for years. When news comes that Arnold has died in Arizona, the two friends set on a bus trip to retrieve his truck and effects. This classic American road trip has many hilarious episodes and it results in a sense of reconciliation with the spirit of their shared father figure. The collection uh, made into this 1998 movie uh, led to other cinematic projects by Alexi, uh, some of uh, which he's actually directed. And I've got a clip here that gives a glimpse of the comic operations of the film. I hope it's going to work. Let's see, here we go. Hey, Victor, sorry to hear about your dad. You need a ride? Oh, yeah. Hey, Thomas. Need a ride? Too bad. What are you going to trade for it? We're Indians, remember? We barter. A story? 
and be good. Better be good. <clears throat> During the 60s, Arnold Joseph was the perfect hippie because all the hippies were trying to be Indians anyway. But because of that, he was always wondering how anybody would know when an Indian was trying to make a social statement. But there's proof, you know. Back during the Vietnam War, he was demonstrating against it and there was this photographer there. He took a picture of Arnold that day and it made it onto the wire services and was reprinted in newspapers throughout the country. It even made it to the cover of Time magazine. In that photograph, Arnold is wearing bell bottoms and a flowered shirt, his hair and braids with red peace symbols splashed across his face like war paint. He holds a rifle above his head, captured in that moment just before he proceeded to beat the shit out of the National Guard private lying on the ground beneath him. Another demonstrator holds a sign just barely visible over his left shoulder. It reads, make love, not war. Jeez, did your dad really do that? Thomas, you're so full of shit. Oh, then what happened? Arnold got arrested, you know, but he got lucky. At first, they charged him with attempted murder, but then they plea bargained that down to assault with a deadly weapon, and then they plea bargained that down to being an Indian in the 20th century. Then he got two years in Walla Walla. Mm. So what do you think? Well, I think it's a fine example of the oral tradition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's just one scene of many I could have showed you was hard to pick. Uh, much of Alexi's work, though, contains more tragedy than comedy. Alcoholism, poverty, drugs, and sexual violence torment many characters, and life on the reservation more often than not seems a life sentence. Many of his later works involve natives who have escaped to the city, sometimes to successful lives, but more often dead ends. Even he has done, disowned his long, despairing, and dark novel, Indian Killer, a pile of crap novel, he says, that focuses on serial killers. Aiming for a hybrid effect, though, his ambitious reservation blues brings back Victor and Thomas, the ones we just saw, uh, as part of a blues band in a tale that interlaces with Black Mississippi traditions, a magical guitar. Um, Gerald Visner and other prominent Native writers, though, have decried his alleged catering to state stereotypes, although I had, should say um, this came after uh, Sherman Alexie trashed Visner, so tit for tat. Anyway, his short stories, though, have been inventive, well-reconstructed, and laced with biting humor, which is usually located at the crossroads of Native and white culture. To conclude, uh, Gagama has asserted, I see the Indian capacity for humor as a blessing, one of the fundamental miracles of our lives. It's pulled us through so much, a force of it is religion. I try to experience all kinds of humor. It's basically the same thing, touching on survival. And this is one of the key thematics that Visner's put forward. He calls it survivance, because he says survivance includes resistance. Perhaps for this reason, native humor has inspired people in unexpected places. Uh, I was astonished just this week, last week, to see a profile of Gloria Steinem in the New York Times, uh, and she attributed her leadership ability to her sense of humor. That's crucial. It allows you to laugh at yourself and say when you're wrong, she says. One of the things that Native American culture understands, and we probably don't, is that laughter is the only emotion you can't compel. You can't make anybody laugh unless they want to. I suspect that the people who last the longest, who continue to be trustworthy, are people with a sense of humor, unquote. Clearly, indigenous people have lasted. Yet because there's so much tragedy in Native history, the image of the crying Indian I began with has occluded a people sustaining and energizing humor. However, as Richard Sewell has noted, without a recognition of a sense of the tragic, comedy loses heart, it becomes brittle. It is animation, but no life. 
Without a recognition of the truths of comedy, tragedy becomes bleak and intolerable, unquote. Humor in its archaic liberating mode subverts an imperial social order and creates an absurd or ideal alternative, if a temporary one, and posits group solidarity in the face of the common enemy. It may well be, in fact, that threatened groups are more inclined to humor than others. Certainly the richest comic traditions in our nation's history would seem to belong to the Jews, Native Americans, and Blacks who for so long had to fight a revolutionary battle against oppression. Humor always present in the oral narratives has taken on an even more important dimension in the ongoing Native American literary renaissance. In a postmodern age, it helps natives analyze the absurdities, contradictions, and injustices of inter internal imperialism in what sometimes seems to be a nightmare world that has plagued Native Americans since the white men landed on this continent. As you know, the, one of the groups most affected by the coronavirus has been uh, Native Americans. As current Indian writers demonstrate in their resistance to domination, Native American humor now seems to speak for all citizens of this land. It is not too much to say that trickster and the Indian humor he creates keeps tribal culture and all that it contributes to America from stagnating. The very engine of dynamism, humor forces us to reinvent the world anew. Thank you.